Hello, hello. Welcome to the Good Garbage Podcast. My name is Veth Krishna. My primary reason for existence has been to find ways to leave our wonderful planet cleaner. We will be speaking with material innovators, creators and propagators to learn from them how we can build for scale and towards a regenerated future. Their stories will help us answer the big question, what is good garbage? Today we get to hear from Julia Marsh, the CEO and founder of Sway. Sway is finding ways to create bioplastics from seaweed and build the company for scale. This conversation is a lot about Julia's amazing journey from being a child inspired by nature, becoming a designer and to applying ideas as an entrepreneur. It was amazing for me to witness the clarity of purpose and the details and technology that Julia brings in. I am sure you will enjoy this conversation as much as I did. Hello, hello. So happy to have Julia Marsh from Sway today. And I have been so excited to talk to you, Julia. You have no idea. Because uh, when we met at Rethinking Materials, I said, oh, this is a young company and they're doing cool stuff. And that was my impression. And then I started listening to you online. And I was like, that is a very, very impressive woman. And I am going to get to learn so much in this conversation. So thank you for taking the time. Thank you for being here and thank you for talking to us. That's so kind. Thank you, Ben. Really happy to be here. So I'm going to actually have you repeat some of the things you've said to others, uh, because I'm sure the, the people listening to this one will be different. But I want to hear more about your inspiration in childhood and your stories of growing around nature and how they impacted you. And I'm, it's, it's just so beautiful to know more about that. Happy to. And I'll add some new little tidbits so it's not all um, recycled material. <laughs> um, I grew up in California uh, in a little area of the world called Carmel, which is right next to Big Sur. You may know it for its beautiful redwood forests and the Bixby Bridge and the ocean. So not such a bad place to grow up. And through my upbringing, I spent a lot of time at the beach in tide pools as a child, there's videos of my sister and I pulling strands of kelp out of the out of the bay and pretending that we're fishing and playing jump rope. And we also spent a lot of time in the forest hiking, identifying plants. My mother was a sort of amateur botanist, and she would always tell us to identify the plants that we were passing by. So from an early age, really a lot of time spent in nature, in the ocean, in the forest, and also, yeah, parents who were engaging with nature and teaching us to appreciate it. So really fortunate to grow up the way that I did. And the bit that I think is really interesting and related to our conversation today is that I was taught from a young age that very common mantra within the outdoor community to leave places better than you find them. And I love that. I totally live by it is how can we actually leave no trace and then in fact, leave places better than we found them. You probably relate with that one as well. Totally. I actually have a very similar saying. I'll just add one more thing to it, and I'm sure you believe in it already. But as a 16-year-old, I was on a survival camp in the Arctic Circle on top of uh, Scotland. And my, my parents were, again, similar to yours because we were always being pushed into out into nature and my father was always out with his clippers with plants and so and I, I lived in the Indian mountains and it was just, just beautiful but uh, one of the many things I was taught on the survival camp uh, was leave people and places better than you found them so you might want to add the people because I'm sure you do leave people and places better than you <laughs> found them and it's been a real mantra for me as well but I, what I want to ask you is also do you remember the earliest impact that packaging had on your life. Uh, so do you remember something from your childhood or later? Is, is there a memory of packaging? Well, I would say we went to great lengths to recycle and sort our plastics and our packaging from a young age. And that was partially out of necessity because at some times we didn't have ready access to like municipal <laughs> garbage or recycling, we'd have to bring it into town. So that was one piece that I'd say I remember. Certainly on hikes out in the wilderness, there was kind of a game for my sister and I where we would try to collect as many pieces of 
litter as possible, which is kind of sad in retrospect. But then there's this other side to my memories of being a young person, a young creative person, and falling in love with the beauty of packaging as well, looking at how packaging can make products exciting and beautiful and even bias you towards wanting to purchase them. And I, I feel like there's two sides of the coin. There's all the yeah negative aspects of what happens when we don't think thoughtfully about materials, but there also is this positive when we do think so thoughtfully and we can use beautiful colors and textures and language to get folks excited about the products that we interact with every day. And that's actually why I became a designer. Yeah, and I'm going to dig more into the designer bit because that's fascinating as well. And I was listening to your beautiful, beautiful conversation at MFA and, you know, uh, the details that you got into were really, really impressive. But I'm going to I'm going to get to that. I'm going to segue a little bit on the, towards the coast of California. So my six year old daughter and me, we did a daddy daughter trip. Uh, we, we live in Portland and Oregon and we drove south and I remember we did a lot of uh, whale watching and things like that and I remember the beauty of that area, all, all the places that you are talking about. One of the things that we use now, and I don't know if you already use it, but taking a cue from your sister and you identifying stuff, uh, we use this app called iNaturalist. And it's so cool because, you know, you just take a picture and my daughter does it all the time now as a six-year-old. I want to look this up. I want to look this up. That's a great parenting hack. I think uh, there's been some talk on the internet around how most children wouldn't be able, or most people generally wouldn't be able to identify 10 local plants and 10 local animals off the top of their head. And I think it's a total privilege to think that way. But increasingly there are apps and methods for us to interact more with the world around us. And it is really, really amazing when you can connect and kind of recognize the flora around you. So I'm going to dive into the designer in Julia and how did that come about? And, you know, tell me more about your designer life. And of course, then we'll segue into how it plays into your current life. Sure. So important to note that my parents really did influence a lot of my appreciation for nature, but also my career. My father is a media producer and a filmographer. He used to produce segments for the Monterey Bay Aquarium, which meant I spent a lot of time in those gorgeous exhibits growing up. And my mother, like I mentioned, amateur botanist and a florist. So this kind of balance between telling stories powerfully and also having this connection to nature and bringing it into people's lives was always present. And that didn't really come to play a role in my career as a designer until later on through Sway, I think. But always the goal was through my work, I'd like to create more beauty in the world. That was the initial motivation. I went to UC Santa Barbara for my undergraduate degree next to the ocean. <laughs> um, most of my friends were in marine programs. I was studying how to produce editorial spreads. After graduation, I went to work in the city as a designer for startups and consumer goods brands where I was primarily responsible for building brand and packaging systems, all the touch points of any given brand. And that's where I really became very familiar with the vastness of the plastic problem, the true limitations around alternatives that are available to people like me in decision-making roles around the materials that are being invited into any given brand. And that's what motivated me to go to grad school and create work of consequence, not just work of beauty. So when you were in that zone of creating and being with, with the brands, building their designs, did you find people who were sensitive to the challenge? Or do you think it is just a material and people were using it and thinking more about how to make it look more attractive and alluring? Or were there people that, like you, were also sensitive to the materials that were being used? I think that absolutely there was a desire and a interest in replacing plastics. It's not very hard to convince someone of that, but the reality was that all the alternatives that were readily available were partial fixes. So it didn't feel like it was worthwhile to overhaul the system if we weren't truly solving the problem. And I, I imagine you run into that as well constantly, where you think, if I'm going to do the work of getting rid of petroplastics, then I really want the alternatives to inspire people or open up their imagination around what's possible for new materials. And at the time, maybe it was 
limited options or maybe it was limited perception that the options were available but i do think that's starting to change no absolutely and you're right even yesterday we were with our innovation team and we were talking about it's not about replacing plastics it's about better biomaterials because as soon as you look at base product and say this is the base product and i'm going to try and replace this you've already put your vision towards a limitation of that product. So, so instead of that, what we have been talking about is look at the usage. You know, this has to be used to carry something from A to B for a certain amount of time or uh, protect something for this amount of time. And that is what it is. Let's look at the usage because sometimes our imaginations get limited by the current product. It's not about replacing, it's evolving. It's evolving humankind and evolving biomaterials. And if humankind can create plastic, petroleum-based stuff, we can create different things again. Absolutely. So how does how does seaweed enter your life? And how did that <laughs> happen? How is that first thing? And who, there must be somebody who talked to you that this stuff can be converted to plastics. And I know you did a whole thesis on it. And how did that happen? I've always been familiar with seaweed and with ocean ecosystems, given my upbringing in the Monterey Bay area. It's really hard, actually, to avoid conversation about kelp when you grow up in Monterey Bay. Um, but really, the interest in tying seaweed and the potential of new materials and replacing plastics did happen during my graduate studies, where I used those two years to do a deep dive into the concept of regenerative materials, which is how we've maybe ended up here in this podcast, and looking at all the different materials that embody the concept of regeneration, seaweed just feels like it should always be at the top of the list. I love that with seaweed, we have this kind of freedom to look at the ocean as a resource and a source of solutions rather than a victim in the story around plastics. And as I started to look at what was materially possible, well, once you fall in love with seaweed, you really can't go back. So <laughs> if we're being honest, that's what happened. I, I love the potential of all these wonderful materials derived from waste or derived from fungi or, or what have you. But I understand seaweed and I understand ocean ecosystems. And then I started to go and visit seaweed farms. And when you get in the water and you see how seaweed is farmed and cultivated and the impact that it has, not just in the ocean, but also for coastal communities, it's really hard to envision that you could commit yourself, you know, commit your life to anything else. So that was the journey for me. It was curiosity followed by getting in the water with seaweed farms and then really doing a deep dive, connecting with as many doctors of phycology and seaweed farmers and seaweed enthusiasts, the ones making food and outerwear and getting really creative with the potentials of seaweed that started this journey in creating Sway. Yeah, but how does a designer get into the science of it? Where is that cusp? You know, it's one thing to fall in love with a certain species, a seaweed, but how does that change happen that I'm going to take this material and create a different material from that or inspired by that? It came from being extremely persistent with the resources I had available to me within my graduate program. But also, I'll tell you the secret, which is that it's very possible to make biomaterials in your kitchen or in your garage. And, <laughs> you know, with resources like Materium, a research organization and open source library of materials, which I absolutely adore, you can find recipes like the ones that I used early on where you order seaweed off the internet <laughs> and it arrives in your tiny apartment and you mix it with a few different additives in a pot and you lay it out. And while the material is not going to look great and it's not going to perform well, it can open up your imagination around what might be possible. And for me, at that early stage, it was enough of a proof point to say, if I, as a designer, not a material scientist, am able to make this simple proof of concept that seaweed can be turned into materials, then certainly when I've assembled a team and polymer scientists, well, the possibilities should be limitless. So that was, that was kind of the early, maybe classic startup story of literally just trying to figure out how to make these materials on my own in my kitchen. 
And that graduated very quickly to finding material experts who would tell me whether my ideas were absolutely ridiculous or not. And uh, you created a few interesting things is somewhere I was reading about it. So do you want to tell us about what all you created with seaweed initially? I was living with my best friends at the time in a small Bushwick apartment and concocting all sorts of different seaweed um, <laughs> compositions on our kitchen stove. And the molds that I could form or create were things like plates. And I used the seaweed concoction to make little cups and I would serve them to my roommates to test whether this was a, a good <laughs> replacement for our normal cups. Did all sorts of experiments, but really the goal was to get to films and replacing thinned film packaging, which I certainly couldn't do on my own in our kitchen. So how did it transition from your concoctions in the kitchen to a thin film? And what's the, what's the basic science around it? And how does that work? So the reason that seaweed makes such a great feedstock for plastics is that it has this natural gelling property. And if you've been to the beach and picked up some of those larger pieces of seaweed, you can envision how this material might be able to turn into a replacement for plastic just by stretching it and playing with it. What is contained within seaweeds are things called hydrocolloids, which is a kind of polysaccharide that naturally gels when it comes into contact with water. And by using those gelling properties, we're able to create films, adding different plant-based additives that can become entirely transparent that are stronger than normal plastics, that can be heat sealed, that have a lot of the basic mechanics of plastics, but also decompose really rapidly. And that comes with shortcomings, performance shortcomings that we've since engineered away from within the formal structure that is sway. But at the time when I was just experimenting with this basic seaweed extract, I was able to kind of prove out that it was possible. And I connected with my friends who are material scientists and just ask them to volunteer their time to experiment more with me in the kitchen using literal just kitchen instruments, nothing formal, nothing fancy. And that was enough to get us to the point where we were able to create a film that didn't look perfect or perform perfectly, but it was enough to get folks excited about it and enabled us to apply to different prizes and challenges and accelerators later on, which really helped the company blossom into a, a real business. And and I have to get into this. I know you've talked about this so much and everybody asks you this, your road trip with Matt and you exploring <laughs> the seaweed farm. But tell us about what inspired that and what was the aim? Uh, what happened? What did you learn? And how did that inspire Sway further? I love that you ask about it because I love to talk about it. Just after finishing my graduate thesis, my co-founder Matt was also finishing his graduate degree at Berkeley. And so our graduations coincided. And at that time, Sway was a fully fledged idea. And we wanted to have more on the ground experience to inform how we might build Sway and turn it, transition it from thesis mode into, into business mode. And so Matt and I built out a 1993 Azuzu Trooper, 1991 built a kitchen in the back, put a rooftop tent on the top, and we said, we're going to literally be on the ground driving from Berkeley, where we live, down to the southernmost tip of Chile. This is called overlanding. I highly recommend it. It's a great way to experience all the wonders of the world with total freedom. You can be off the grid. We drove through Baja, stopping along with uh, seaweed farms along the way, went through Mexico, visited Deserto, which is the cactus-based leather company in Guadalajara, traveled through the Caribbean, visiting with folks who are trying to engineer solutions for sargassum and the sargassum blooms happening there, then down through Belize, every Central American country through Panama, then crossed the channel and went from Colombia, Ecuador down to Peru, and all along the way visiting as many folks related to seaweed or related to biomaterial innovation as possible. One of my favorite companies is called Chua Plant. They're based in Peru, and they make plates from discarded banana stem waste. Something interesting I learned is that the banana plant is not a tree, it's a plant, but the, the waste can be used to make plates and cups and 
it was so meaningful to connect with folks in all of these countries who are being so creative about using the materials around them to create solutions. So that was really motivating. <laughs> Unfortunately, we didn't make it to Chile like we'd planned, where all the seaweed is happening because COVID struck in April of 2020. And we were politically evacuated. And when we got back in California, we incorporated the company and built that team and applied the Beyond the Bag Challenge and the rest is history. So great. Let's immediately segue into the Bag Challenge. So, so what was that like? And what did you compete with? And what were you presenting? And how did you manage to win that prize? We had a clear sense of what was possible with seaweed just by the experimentation we'd done makeshift in the kitchen. I'd built out a team alongside my co-founder, Matt. Well, he's my partner of seven years. And we really focused on this holistic vision that we had for the company and, and for the material, which is new materials can only succeed and thrive if there is an enabling and receptive environment for them. So we need a lot of impact data to get brands excited about adopting this new material. And we also need really robust narratives so that when brands do adopt our material, we can get everybody on board, not just the sustainability team, but the CFO and the marketing team. So we built from the get-go a foundational LCA that projected the impact and life cycle of our product. And we also added members of the team related to impact and sourcing that could help us project what our wild success what effect that might have on the planet, on ocean ecosystems, on compost infrastructure, etc. And with that knowledge, the basic prototype, a sense of our supply chain, and a sense of our potential impact, we applied to the Beyond the Bag Challenge, which was organized by Closed Loop Partners and IDEO. And then we won, which was so <laughs> game-changing for a young organization with really just the basic building blocks put together, some great resources and incredible mentors across different disciplines, but really there was a lot to figure out. And that program, the Beyond the Bag Challenge, helped facilitate research. It gave us direct access to packaging and procurement officials at the top of the <laughs> at the top of the food chain, customer insights, regulatory insights, the opportunity to test our material in compost facilities. So it just really opened the floodgates for what was possible for us and accelerated into becoming a proper business. That's totally amazing. Well done. Want to be a part of the next big thing in compostable packaging? Check out gcahub.com. Create your free account and connect with others in the compostable packaging industry. On GCA Hub, you can exchange ideas, solutionize problems, network, and learn through curated resources. Now let's get back to the conversation. Explain to us a little more about how you plan to scale. And, mm -hmm. and in scaling, what I heard a little bit about was that ultimately it's going to be resin and pellets. That is what is going to be the product. And then the same blow film machines that use plastics, the same supply chain can make use of it. Absolutely. So the composition of our materials are inspired by nature. And what we aim to do is use the naturally abundant polymers that are found in an array of different types of seaweed to create films in various traditional plastic production methods. And what we're interested in is having a whole portfolio of bio-based solutions that really are focused on using seaweed and solve a number of different problems that brands are facing. And one of the best ways to do that within our portfolio is designing for blown film infrastructure, which is really, really hard to do <laughs> with seaweed. But we have technology and an incredible technical team that's enabling us to do that. Something I'm really excited by is... This year, as we scale with traditional plastic manufacturers in the United States and test our materials, primarily in the form of poly bags and retail bags, this will be the opportunity for us to really understand the limitations of our technology. And then, assuming that everything goes according to plan, which it never does within material development, but assuming it all goes according to plan, we'll have the opportunity next year and in the coming years to replicate 
our model outside of the United States into Asia, into Europe. And I think this is where we really achieve our impact is building a model where we understand exactly what's happening in the water. We understand exactly how the seaweed is being processed. We're creating resin and then film with traditional infrastructure. And then we're able to trace exactly how the material decomposes at the end of its life. And if all of that can be traced and we can replicate it elsewhere with similar machinery and across different regions where seaweed is grown, there is the potential that pragmatically we actually can make seaweed materials readily accessible to people. And it's not just going to be this sort of theoretical exercise that seaweed has potential, but might not ever make it into my hands. You've talked before about in terms of different varieties of seaweed and their different properties and uh, and the compounding of that material. So how does that happen? Have you gotten to that stage where you're realizing this one gives this kind of property and this one gives this and this is how we compound it? And you just said it's really hard to, to sort of use it in blow film. Why is it so hard? So we are early, so I'll, I'll try to share as much as I possibly can without getting into trouble with seaweed. We are just at the beginning, and I say that as an industry, we're just at the beginning of really understanding the full and true breadth of opportunity within seaweed polymers, these naturally abundant polymers, because there's over 12,000 species of seaweed and they grow everywhere on earth. There's 7 million square kilometers of seaweed currently growing along earth's coastlines. We have a handful of them in our lab. We've been testing across a couple dozen of species. The way that they're cultivated, the regions in which they're cultivated, and then just their inherent properties all vary really significantly. What we're trying to prioritize are sourcing from ocean farms, because then we can understand the direct contribution we're making to ocean ecosystems and the number of livelihoods that we're hopefully improving through, through our sourcing strategy. But then, of course, we also prioritize different performance characteristics. So an example would be Different types of red seaweeds have fabulous tensile strength. When you extract different agars from different types of red seaweed, typically result in a film that has fabulous tensile strength, but struggles with elongation. Versus if you were to work with capophycus, which is a, a common type of carrageenan-producing seaweed that grows in tropical waters, depending on the strain of capophycus, you see greater elongation as a material property. So it's our theory, and it's reasonable to stand, and this is readily available on the internet, that by combining the properties of different types of seaweeds, we can find that perfect film and that perfect composition. Some of the shortcomings and some of the challenges related to working with seaweed is, I guess, maybe obvious. Seaweed loves water. <laughs> it loves water. It's very hydrophilic. So that'll be a challenge for any company aiming to work with seaweed in environments that are traditionally very dry. And why is it hard to blow into a film? Is that is that an inherent property or is that something you guys are just cracking and getting to the result of it? We're cracking the code. Yeah. And that's what our first patent surrounds. Although it's our goal to constantly be iterating on the methods and means in which we can use seaweed within traditional plastic infrastructure. Of course, Plastic machinery, <laughs> blown film extruders were not designed for seaweed. And so we're trying to be as clever and creative around how we can fit into that equipment because we truly believe that's the only way that new materials can scale. And of course, I realize that you're early stage and there's only that much you can share. But what is the, just an overview on what is the process? So if, you, if you're taking seaweed, then you're ultimately trying to extract something from it. And, uh, and and is there a process that you've already cracked or is that in too early a stage to sort of uh, talk about? I can share what's just readily available around the seaweed industry and one of the major bottlenecks that we run into, which I would love someone listening to this podcast to help us solve. So as I mentioned, seaweed grows on every coastline in the world, 12,000 plus species, three categories, reds, greens, and browns. Primary extracts of those seaweeds are agar, carrageenan, and alginate. And those are 
usually the extracts that are used in different seaweed biomaterials. There are dozens now of companies like mine using seaweed to create replacements for plastic. And all of us are using different species and all of us are using different extracts. And some of us are also aiming to use the whole plant. In a dream world, we're not having to extract this cellulose and this polysaccharide content from the seaweed. In an ideal world, you could just convert the plant over to a replacement for plastic. An opportunity that I think is really present is innovating around those extraction and processing methods. Currently, what happens typically is you harvest the seaweed from the farm, basically give the seaweed a haircut, pull it onto the beach, it dries under the sun, has to get down to a really low moisture content. Then it runs through this two-step alkali extraction process where what you're left with is a powder, an agar, a carrageenan, and an alginate, and you're left with leftover biomass. And depending on the species, you can be left with anywhere from 20 to 50% leftover biomass that currently is just being dumped back in the ocean or it's being used to fertilize the trees that maybe grow around the production facility. And so there's such a good opportunity here to find less wasteful extraction processes and also to develop other beautiful value-added products from that leftover biomass. And I, I really hope someone listening will do this. <laughs> I am personally jumping on that bandwagon. So, so all we know is cellulose, uh, where, where we work. So, you know, this is uh, music uh, to our ears and it, it'll be awesome to test the biomass and see how we can use it. and. And yeah, lots of work uh, that can be done. So when you say uh, agar, it's the same thing as an agar agar powder that comes from seaweed. Exactly. As a as a vegan, I've been using it so much, <laughs> and, and I didn't know that it comes from seaweed. Seaweed is in a lot of is very present in our lives, probably more so than folks imagine. We think of sushi, or we think of the stuff that washes ashore when we visit the beach, but. Seaweed is a thickening agent in most foods and cosmetics. So your ice cream might have it. Your toothpaste probably has it. And a lot of your creams, your bedtime creams, that's the primary market for seaweeds today, which is helpful because it means that most of the extracts that we're working with are already food grade and will fast track our path towards food contact certification. But there's also opportunities for, for seaweed farmers to extend the life cycle of their plant if they're not held to that same standard that a human's going to ingest this product. And we hope that that'll open up new opportunities. The bioplastic industry, biomaterials industry will open up new opportunities for ocean farmers. And what's, what's carrageenan? What is that like and what does it do? Similar, similar. Gelling agent. Okay, agar agar and carrageenan are similar in their usage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and same with alginate, although you may be familiar with some of the different alginate products that are used for creating molds. There are some instances where you can use alginate to create the teeth molds that you find at the dentist. So just imagine anything related to gelling, seaweed's probably involved in some way. Wow, I had no idea. Thank you for that. It's so heartening when you when I hear you talk about people working with biomaterials all being on the same sort of journey. And it is so true, you know. I just love like I'm so inspired by the work you're doing and I'm I'm literally rooting for you. But then how do you see significant scale? Because you and I know the size of the challenge is so huge. How do you see yourself in the next five years or ten years? I totally agree. I think Everyone within biomaterials, and especially within this category of regenerative design, are rooting for each other, because we do need an ecosystem of solutions to tackle the immensity of the problem. We're specifically focused on thin film plastics at the moment, wrappers, pouches, baggies, the really annoying plastics that no one really wants. And there are five trillion pieces of this type of thin film packaging produced every year globally. So we've got our work cut out for us in the next five, 10 years. My vision for us and for biomaterials as a whole is that we're able to collaborate more fully so that we do better match materials to the appropriate application like you were speaking about earlier. We don't want all materials to be replaced by seaweed. 
We want seaweed to play a role where it's making meaningful change. And we want to amplify opportunities for seaweed to do what it's really, really good at, which is turning into healthy soil at the end of its life, actually creating healthier soil in the process, but then also improving ocean health. So my big concern and my hope for the next five, 10 years is that we can act in collaboration with other ocean organizations, with other seaweed biomaterials companies in creating standards that protect the ocean and enable us to avoid some of the harms of the past. But this could look like creating a new a new standard for, for ocean materials or blue materials that's akin to the FSC certification for sustainable paper and sustainable land forestry. What if there was an equivalent for the forests that are growing under the sea and the materials that are sourced from them? That's my big dream. So somebody who's transitioned from a designer to a businesswoman, do you have a number? that this many tons is what you want to replace in a few years? Do you have those sort of big, hairy, audacious goals? I mean, there are 180 billion poly bags produced every year in the fashion industry alone. That's my, my big number at the moment. But we're looking at food packaging as the holy grail for us. And if we can successfully engineer packaging, which performs at such a high level to protect things like you know, snicker bars and, and cliff bars, that'll be the real dream for me. And the immensity of that goal is can't be um, understated. For sure. And that's a complex one, because of course, uh, you and I both know, again, it's multi-layered barriers in terms of, especially water vapor barrier is a difficult one. We've been working on it for a while, and it's it's a big challenge. Is there inherent properties that you're seeing in terms of barriers, uh, which will work? Uh, for food packaging, uh, like the ones you're talking about, flexible packaging? We've yet to kick off our investigation into food packaging, really focused on applications within fashion and then both retail and e-commerce packaging. However, in certain research papers and what we've observed about the inherent properties of seaweed, there's the potential that seaweed actually extends shelf life. And this might apply more so in applications related to just fresh produce. It's to be determined how we'll be able to engineer, and I'm sure it will be a long journey, the multi-layered packaging as well. But don't stop, please, going, because we desperately need those solutions. And it's something that's really, like I see you talk about it in terms of your team. It's a bunch of very, very inspired people that give us courage. And I'm sure you are witnessing that as you are growing your team as well, right? Very much. Everyone's unified by this idea that our success means a more healthy, equitable, safer, cleaner planet. That's so easy to rally around, no matter your discipline or background. And I'm really heartened by the number of companies like ours that are emerging across climate solutions where everyone's being invited to the table. You don't need to be specifically practiced in sustainable development in order to be a part of the movement. We need engineers and mathematicians and educators and fabulous designers to really contribute to solutions that can thrive and become accessible to folks. And maybe my not so controversial take in this setting is that every company should be doing work for climate. And well, if you look to the sustainable development goals, or if you read books like Dr. Ayanna Elizabeth Johnson's All We Can Save, you can see the infinite opportunities we have to enact meaningful solutions within our daily work, regardless of our discipline, regardless of even of our proximity to fossil fuel companies, where we can all contribute to the solutions. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to totally segue uh, into people. How do you find people on Instagram? <laughs> Did you read that? <laughs> yes. <laughs> this is a total millennial thing. I have no idea how. I, I can hardly find people on LinkedIn. You know? so, so how does she find people there? In the beginning of Sway, I really thought it was important that we should have a public-facing presence and that even though most material companies, although there are wonderful exceptions, but most material companies don't give direct access to the team's building the materials, I thought, how cool would it be if we did? And if we made this journey accessible and beautiful, so beautiful that people wanted to keep up with us. 
So we've had a pretty active Instagram presence from the get-go where we've invited peers in the material space who I really admire and look to as leaders. And that's naturally drawn in like-minded folks who have an array of different talents. So when we advertise job openings on the Sway team, weirdly, Instagram has helped us find some of our best talent um, <laughs> because they're the most enthusiastic and they've been following along with our journey and they say, I can kind of see myself in this company. I care about oceans. I care about materials. I spend a lot of time outdoors and I'm a positive and optimistic person. So I can see myself in this company. Yeah, weirdly, Instagram, good hiring mechanism. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's definitely a new learning for me. I'm definitely getting our recruiters to listen to this one. So the other thing you talk a lot about, and it's beautiful to hear, is this whole idea of regenerative instead of sustainable. So my challenge has always been, we can create a lot of regenerative products but I still find it a big challenge to create regenerative processes, especially when you're trying to do it at scale. And I know that you're still sort of scaling, but I'm sure you have a decent handle on your process. Uh, have you managed to crack the code even on the process side? And even if it's not regenerative, does it consume very little? That's such a good question. I can paint a picture of our full supply chain and identify the points where I feel regeneration has the biggest role to play. And I think that for a company of our size at this early stage, naturally, number one priority is make an incredible product and get it into the hands of consumers. But as much as we can, we're trying to amplify those opportunities for regeneration. That starts at sea, in the ocean working with ocean farmers who have been doing this kind of work for either centuries or for decades where they've converted from fishing and are now cultivating ocean forests at sea. We're looking at what seaweed does for oceans, whether that's the sequestration of carbon or the contribution to biodiversity by creating habitat or the reversal of ocean acidification, which is a consequence of climate change. And measuring all those things helps us trace how are we truly regenerating nature and how can we grow this very important feedstock in such a way that we're not over-extracting. It's part of the reason that we've diversified the types of seaweed that we work with, and we're trying to also diversify the regions where we source seaweed from. And I think that's just a basic principle of regeneration is no over-reliance, only abundance. There's another opportunity for regeneration just related to coastal employment, where there's been these over-extractive fishing practices or other negative harms of climate change that have affected coastal communities. And seaweed can be an incredible transitional economy and opportunity for those people living there. One example is in Colombia, where a number of small indigenous communities have been primarily reliant on lobster fishing for the past decades. Seaweed can come in as another opportunity to both restore ocean health, but also provide income and employment. Then there's the processing piece, which we've designed to fit into traditional infrastructure. We're using the extracts that come from seaweed and compounding them with other plants to create resin that can be blown into film. We're trying to identify the ways that we can work with renewable energy, ensure that the folks within these plastic manufacturing facilities are being treated very well and looking at how we can impact the human element of production. And then finally, when the material makes its way into a person's home and they get the seaweed-based material in their hands, it's really important that we tell folks that story, that, that this came from the ocean, that we know the farmers who cultivated that seaweed, and hopefully the person interacting with the material stops to think I have a direct relationship with the ocean now, even though I live in Omaha. <laughs> and then when the material is composted, it's creating hopefully healthier soil. So that's the kind of whole life cycle of the material. I've left out some significant bits that I can't really get into. But those are the opportunities for regeneration that we see today. And hopefully if that's the baseline, we can constantly add to it and improve it. It's two things there. Uh, one is uh, when you're looking at eventually manufacturing, so basically, can you create smaller facilities nearer to the source and nearer to the market so that your carbon footprint is lower when it comes to transportation? 
That's the first part. The second part, my challenge always is that as an industry, I find that we don't have a process where we can actually give back more than we take in, whether it's energy, it's water, it's everything in between. So, so that's something that's been a constant struggle for me. So those two things, how are you thinking about placing your factories whenever you have your factories? And then the process, both from the standpoint of size of the project and the methodology of processing. Absolutely. The dream is hyperlocalization and we do believe it's possible and that's why we're spending so much time this year and next making sure that the model that we build is replicable and that we can move the production method and process that we're using today abroad and especially in regions where the majority of seaweed is grown, which today is China, Indonesia, Korea, Japan, which is very convenient for, for plastic production as well. So there's this interesting synergy between where seaweed thrives and where plastic is being produced. And I love the opportunity to localize production methods as much as possible. The primary bottleneck is the seaweed processing itself. So extracting the agar, the carrageen, and the alginate, whatever it is, from the seaweed. And we need more of those extraction facilities, those biorefining facilities to exist in order for seaweed materials to succeed at scale. The second half of the question, we are, it's early days. And we do think about how we can enact impact and reduce our overall footprint as much as possible. I think the way we succeed in that is by collaborating with organizations that know better today so that we're not setting ourselves up for some big failure later on. So we look to experts like, well, there's the ocean organizations like Sustainable Ocean Alliance. Five Gyres is an amazing one that we love. There's Lonely Whale. And then there's also the packaging organizations, which we love. Sustainable Packaging Coalition being the big one plant-based products council. These are the organizations that are helping us set up frameworks from the get-go that hopefully set us up for success later on. It is a constant concern though, and it's maybe something that warrants a much deeper conversation, but can you really produce any material and not negatively impact the world? In the future, I would love to be able to advocate on behalf of reducing material usage overall. And I know that you've talked about this in prior podcasts. No packaging is the best packaging. And I think that's why it's so important to find really specific applications for these new materials where they make sense and where they are truly going to do more good than harm. I wanted to just mention a couple of things to your earlier comments. And I don't know if we got talking about this and rethinking materials or not, but I was doing a master's in biomimicry. And one of the things I loved was uh, seaweeds. And I came from the pulp and paper making discipline where the angle of our fiber is typically 25 degrees. And usually, and I'm sure you know this much better than me because there's so many kinds of seaweed, but what I studied was the seaweed has it at 60 degrees, the cellulosic fiber. And that just changes everything in terms of elasticity and tensile. And, you know, so that was so amazing for me to see. And of course, many, many other properties in terms of being hydrophilic and elastic. I love this. I love drawing comparisons to between terrestrial forests and ocean forests and the way that seaweeds grow that make them well inclined for new materials. And so exactly to your point, trees imagine a redwood tree is not being constantly <laughs> pushed back and forth by ocean waves, whereas kelp and the stem or the stipe that's producing it has to be trained to constantly react to the current. And that's what builds up the alginate content in it. And that alginate is what we're able to use to gel and create films. So there is this direct correlation just this underwater world that we don't usually see and that environment and what seaweeds have evolved to have to withstand and how strong they've had to become is really inspiring. You can see similar kind of parallels there with just the diversity of underwater life and how there's natural intercropping and opportunities for multi-trophic farming where numerous different species are benefiting from their proximity to each other. So for example, oysters love to grow in proximity to kelp because kelp 
is purifying the water around it. I love that kind of interplay between these different underwater water life forms. And the more we can show folks this, I hope the more innovation will come and kind of be derived from the ocean. Yeah, <laughs> that's amazing. There's so much more to learn there. So. I heard the stat that I was shocked by, which I actually didn't know, which is 94% of Earth's wildlife is in the ocean. 94%. I'm sure you may be right because we don't know so much there. I want to talk to you about your love for PLA. <laughs> so talk to me about that. I think that there are so many opportunities to work with different materials and there's a great fit for every material. There's a, there are places where plastics make perfect sense, where we need a high degree of performance. I'm an avid believer in pairing the design of the material with the application. So if a material is intended to live forever and it's going to be used forever, then it should be derived from plastic or a different type of, of feedstock, you know, aluminum or glass or what have you. I think the role of compostables is to make it as easy as possible for the consumer to do the right thing. And that means designing for human error and the realities of compost infrastructure today. So I'm just really enthusiastic about rapid degradation timelines. <laughs> I want the TUV Austria home compost standard or better for all compostable materials that are likely in some cases to go to industrial compost. Hopefully they're being home composted on your counter or in your backyard compost, but in most cases are going to landfill. And in that real scenario, we want materials that degrade as quickly as other organic matter. So that's my my uh, my take on on materials and and uh, no hate towards any given material. I think they all have a role to play. Beautifully put. I couldn't agree with you more. Ultimately, ultimately we have to be inspired by nature, and things need to degrade as they do in nature, and that means home or backyard compost solutions. What I love about composting as compared with recycling or other end of life mechanisms is that you can see composting happen right before your eyes. So if a shopper is concerned about whether the material is actually going to degrade, they can literally watch it happen. And I think that's going to open up a lot of opportunity for new materials and building trust with the consumer. I totally agree with you. And transparency has to be there. People want to know. And that's, that's how you can, they can trust. My last question to you is, what does good garbage mean to you? And how do you see it as uh, we progress as humankind? I love the phrase that is often used within this industry, which is design does not create waste. And I think if we truly embody the principles of the circular economy, good garbage is actively regenerating nature and replenishing life. It's creating healthier ecosystems. It's creating healthier soil. And in between, it's making people feel like they have a role to play in the next generation's future <laughs> and sustaining and creating life on this planet. So yeah, good garbage can be engineered, it can be designed, it can be beautiful, um, and hopefully it's, it's replenishing life. Thank you so much, Julia. This has been such a wonderful conversation. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being the person you are and the things that you're doing. I cannot wish you enough luck. You know, I hope Swig keeps growing from strength and I hope we get to keep interacting and doing things together and you know, leave behind a better planet. Thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you, Ben. Thank you once again for listening and thank you for your ideas. I look forward to more and more suggestions and questions coming from you as you listen and explore these amazing ideas that come from our guests. Please follow us on numerous social media channels and give your insights. Thank you so much.